We begin looking at MSI logic circuits by looking at the decoder. Uh, now an MSI logic circuit, it stands for medium scale integrated circuit. And what that means is it refers to the size of the, of the logic. So you can kind of measure it in the number of transistors. So this stands for medium scale integrated circuit logic. And it's, it's a measure of basically, you can kind of think of it as the number of transistors in a system. And so for example, in this one, uh, MSI refers to, you know, it might have hundreds of transistors in it. But what it really refers to is when you have, uh, when you have basic gates forming some of the most common logic operations that are needed by the community. And if you think about basic gates, they're also created with integrated circuits, but we call them small-scale integrated circuit logic, and the number of transistors there might be tens of transistors. But one of the first things that you do when you start designing logic is you take these basic gates and you build some of these common uh, building blocks, so things such as decoders or adders or multiplexers and things like that. So what, it, what manufacturers started doing is they said, well, since everybody's building these, we'll just, we'll just make these as parts and sell them. Uh, but the, it's good to study MSI logic because it really re-emphasizes the whole combinational logic design approach because these are going to be uh, small enough that you can design them by hand and you're going to have some functionality given in the form of a truth table or an expanded truth table and you just walk through methodically designing them from start to finish. So if you go beyond uh, uh, MSI, you get to large scale integrated circuit and this is thousands of transistors and this represents, LSI represents about the largest you can go by uh, designing by hand. And once you get to VLSI, that's where V stands for very large and the very large, it basically d represents where you can't design it by hand anymore. So this is so many gates, so many transistors that you need to rely exclusively on a CAD tool. But let's start looking at a decoder and we'll kind of walk through the, the design approach and uh, get some review on combinational logic design theory. So there's a couple different types of decoder, but in general, a decoder is a system where its inputs are what we call encoded and its outputs, as you might imagine, are decoded. Now, what does it mean to be encoded? So you encode something when you try to save space or area. Uh, in this situation, we're encoding it to try to save the number of inputs coming into the system. So for example, you might encode something in binary or encode it in, in some, any, any number of codes in order to represent some information in a compact way. Uh, the outputs are decoded, meaning that they assert for particular codes. So you might have an output that asserts for one code, you might have a assert for only a certain number of codes, but they assert for specific codes. Now a decoder can have, decoders usually have a larger number of outputs than they do on the inputs, which makes sense because the inputs are encoded. Uh, but then the outputs of the decoder themselves are usually used to drive some sort of uh, other system which needs a unencoded or decoded interface. So let's take a look at let's take a look at a one-hot decoder as an example. There's a variety of different types of decoders, but let's start with a one-hot. And in a one-hot decoder, what we're going to have is we're going to have a one-hot decoder, and that simply means that one output is asserted for only one binary code on the input. And let's do a 2 to 4 decoder as an example. So let's just say we had a system that looked like this and it had two inputs and let's call them A and B and then let's say it had four outputs and we'll call them F0, F1, F2, F3. And when you take one of these MSI logic circuits you still draw its functionality out with a truth table. It's just that the truth table is a little bit more expanded. So let's take a look at what this truth table might look like. So let's say you had A and B as the inputs, and you still list out each and every possible input code. And then what you're going to do is you're going to list out all of the outputs in the same truth table. So in this situation, I'd have F3, F2, F1, and F0. And then the way the behavior of this one-hot decoder works is that each output is going to assert for one and only one input code. So F0 refers to, it will assert for input code 00, or said another way, decimal code 0. 
and all the other codes on the input, it will not be asserted. So an F1 is going to assert for input code 0, 1, but unasserted for all the rest. And F2 will be asserted for 1, 0. And then finally, F3 will be asserted for only 1, 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to design this using our classical digital or classical combinational logic design approach. And remember that a logic expression, when we write a logic expression for F0, it only has a scalar output. It only has a one-bit output. That means that you actually have to write four logic expressions for this functionality. You have to write one for each of the outputs. Now, what you can do is you can go back later and try to optimize and try to find common terms amongst the outputs that, or the output logic expressions that you can share. But you always start these designs by writing out the logic expressions for each one individually. So let's start with F0. And in a one-hot decoder, one of the easiest ways to do it is to synthesize it using a canonical form, which it turns out that that's the best way to do it anyway. Uh, I mean, the most optimal way, minimal way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the logic expression for F0. And let's just put its, its uh, min term list there, too. It's going to assert for only row 0. And I'll write the min term for it, which will be A0 and it would be not. Then I can come in here and I can say, the logic expression for F1 is going to assert for only row 1, and that'll be A0 and with B. Then we're going to have the logic expression for F2 is going to be asserted only for row 2, and that will be A and it would be not. And then finally we have F3, which is only going to assert for row 3, and that's going to be A and it would be. So if you look at that, I can actually draw the final the final logic diagram for it. And I'll come over here and I'll say, okay, so here's my logic diagram. And I'm going to have a product term for each of the outputs. So F0, F1, F2, and F3. And then coming into it, I'm going to have, for the first one, I'll have A0 and then B0. And I'll write them as just A0, B0 in the logic expression. We'll see the inverters in a second. So then the second one's going to be A0, B. Third one will be A, B0. And then we'll have A and B. So if you look at this, the inputs, we obviously have A and B coming in. And they come in and they produce the internal nodes A and B. But we can also notice that many of these product terms use A0. So what I can do is I can use a single inverter and I can produce A0 that can be shared amongst all the product terms. And I can do the same thing here with B. So I can produce B0. So you finally see that there's a little bit of an optimization there. So this is a 2 to 4 one-hot decoder. Now if you extend this to be larger number of inputs, you notice that you have N inputs and that can support up to 2 to the N outputs. So we did a 2 to 4 and you could also expand that to be a 3 to 8 or a 4 to 16 or a 5 to 32. And what's interesting about it is you can kind of watch the way they think these scale. So if I said I want to look at the number of AND operations, well, each output is going to have an AND gate. So this one will have four AND gates, 1, 2, 3, 4. If we expanded it and designed a 3 to 8, it would have eight AND gates. This one would have 16 AND gates. This would have 32 AND gates. The number of inputs, so you'd say like the fan in of each in of each AND gate, or the number of inputs, that'd be a better way to say it, the number of inputs on each AND gate would be the number of inputs in the system, because we're doing a canonical form. So this would be the, each of the four AND gates would have two inputs. Each of the eight AND gates in the 3 to 8 decoder would have three inputs. Each of the 16 AND gates in a 4 to 16 decoder would have four inputs. Each of the 32 AND gates in a 5 to 32 decoder would have five. Then you could also say how many inverters are in each one of these. So if I said how many inverters, well, assuming that you don't run, run into a fan in, or excuse me, a fan out consideration, which is where A not may not be able to drive as many loads as are required, you would say that you're going to have two inverters here, and that will produce the complements of each input variable. You'd have three inverters here, four inverters here, and five inverters there. So that's a one-hot decoder, and that's a, it's a very common circuit when it comes to doing things such as addressing, so addressing memory cells or addressing agents on a bus. Okay, uh, let's take a look at 
another type of decoder, a very common type of decoder, and that's a seven segment display decoder. So in a seven segment display decoder, what we have is, these are the, the displays that you'll find on most digital alarm clocks. What you're gonna have is seven LEDs that are called segments, and they're labeled A, B, C, D, E, and E, F, and G. And what you do is you assert these to try to create characters. So in this situation, if we had a three input uh, into a decoder, we could create the symbol zero, one, two, three, up to seven. So you would, if you wanted to create more, more characters, you'd have to have more inputs. So if you wanted to go up to, if you wanted four inputs, you could have up to 16 characters. But let's just look at this one of just roughly how you design this. So what I'm gonna do with this is I come up with a table and for each of the input codes, I decide which of the segments need to be on. So notice that for 000, and I wanna create a zero, I would turn on all the LEDs except for G. And when I want to do a 1, I would turn on only B and C in order to create the character 1. So you continue to, to draw out these patterns. And then what you do is you basically highlight right here, or you list right here in a table form, whether segment A was on or off for each of the possible input codes. So notice that for the code 0, it was in the input code 000, it was indeed on. For 001, it was off. So notice that you didn't need that upper segment. For 010, you did need it, so it was back on. For 3, you needed it. And you list those out for each and every segment. Now remember, each of these segments is driven by its own unique combinational logic circuit. So in this situation, we have a 3 to 7 character display decoder, and each of these 7 outputs is going to need its own logic circuit. So we would just simply walk through it step by step. The block diagram would look like this. You'd have 3 inputs, you'd have 7 outputs, and then this is the table that we got from that last picture. And you really just go through each and every one and you create a logic expression for it. Now in this situation, they're not, the outputs are not related to each other as, as closely as in a one hot decoder. So you, you manually have to go in and try to create the minimal logic expression or a minimized logic expression. And then you build seven separate circuits that then drive each of the segments in the display. So that's another very common uh, decoder circuit.